Um, so uh, I was telling first service before I got up here, like Gracie asked, like, are you nervous? And I'm like, eh. she's like, a little bit. I'm like, no, I'll be way better once I get on stage. And uh, I always am like nervous beforehand. Most people like when they get on stage, that's when they start freaking out. But for me, one thing I always like found that grounds myself whenever I'm up here is, and I'm going to do it now, is I always want to enter in prayer. And that's how we should always enter because when I come up here, I'm just another person. But God is the one who speaks. God is the one that's moving. And he has a lot more interesting things to say than I do. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you first off that this is a beautiful day that you have made. And that's why we can rejoice and be glad in it. No matter what else today holds, we know that you have made it. And it is good because of that. Pray today that as I am speaking, that you shut my mouth and you anoint me to speak as the oracles of God. And that your words come flowing out that the Holy Spirit has free reign to speak what you want me to speak, and that your people receive what they need to hear today, that no matter what's going on in their life, that you are speaking to their situation. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So today I want to talk about the idea of the heart of a servant. Now, a lot of people have an idea of what it means to be a servant. And we can be like, ah, oh, I'm a good servant. I, I love, I have a servant's heart. And we see this a lot in our culture. Our culture is obsessed with the servant heart mentality right now. And if you don't believe me, I can prove it in a couple of ways. How many of you love Disneyland? By a show of hands, how many of you love Disneyland? Okay. None of you love Disneyland for the incredibly long lines. None of you love Disneyland for the 7 to $10 churro you're about to buy. None of you loves when your children are like crying and begging to go to Disneyland all the way up until the trip. And then once you get them in the car, they're crying and freaking out because they're tired and exhausted. None of you love that about Disneyland. But what you guys absolutely love is the experience. Because when you go there, the service is unparalleled. When you go there, they're excited to see you. They make you happy. That line that you just waited 40 minutes in is totally worth it now. For me, my favorite ride at Disneyland, without question, is Jungle Cruise. Because when I get on that ride and they start giving me that deadpan humor that like everyone else is like, why are we here? I'm just like, yes, I love this. This is what I'm here for. And that 40 minute wait is all of a sudden fine. I, I've justified it by getting to laugh the entire ride. Same thing with Chick-fil-A. A lot of you love Chick-fil-A, and Chick-fil-A is the number one rated fast food chain years running in a row. And the reason why is that when you go to Chick-fil-A, you receive incredible service. When you say thank you, they don't respond with, yep, not a problem. Uh-huh. Like, they say, my pleasure. They recognize that it is an honor and a pleasure to serve. They have a service mentality. I, was, uh, I had a friend of mine at a... Uh, like summer camp come up to me and he told me, he's like, Cameron, you just have such a servant's heart. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I have a servant's heart. I like that. And one of my other friends who's always, you know, quick to keep me in check, you know, humility check. And he was like, you know, Cameron, you can really tell if you have a servant's heart by how do you respond when people start treating you like one? All of a sudden that narrative changed real quick because when someone starts treating you like a servant, you don't like it. When all of a sudden it's expected and they start asking you to do things and telling you to do things, you're all of a sudden like, hey, I don't have to be here, you know. I am volunteering. You don't, I don't owe you anything. Do you have any idea how amazing I am at that? Good luck. Good luck with them. And we get this pride and all of a sudden when people start treating us like one. It's quite different, huh? You know, the questions that I want to start off first with is, what does a servant's heart look like? And I want to start with one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and that's Mark 10, 45. It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus preached an upside-down kingdom. Now, if you hear that, some of you might be like, I think his building's still the same way, like entrances on the top, it's not like flipped. No, 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 that's not what it means at all. An upside-down kingdom means that Jesus said that those who are last shall be first, that if you want to be greatest of all, you must be servant of all. And so here he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for, men, for many. How many of you know that if anybody deserves to be served, to be worshipped, to be praised, it's Jesus? 
How many of you know that any good and perfect thing comes from God and he deserves to be? It's not that like, ah, he's a pretty good person, we should serve him. No, he is unparalleled in his goodness and he deserves it. But he said that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Ephesians 5.1 says that we are to be imitators of God as beloved children. So how much more are we to follow this example that Jesus set? I want to take you through a couple scriptures because a lot of times people say, well, like, that's Old Testament, this is New Testament, or this is New Testament, and, like, Old Testament's irrelevant. But it's not, that's not how it works. And especially with a servant's heart, the narrative has never changed from Old Testament to New Testament. And as I go throughout my sermon today, I'll give you examples Old Testament to New Testament to show you that a servant's heart has always been God's intention. So we're going to go to Mark 9.35. And he sat down called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and a servant of all. See, I didn't make that verse up. It's actually in the Bible. See, we have a very different mindset in the world. It's the people that are at the top of the ladders, the CEOs, the uh, founders, the entrepreneurs that are, tend to be at the top. And in their day in society, it was the same. You had the kings, the queens, and then it was the nobles and and then after that was the um, more uh, knights, military. After that was the craftsmen, the laborers. And then below that was the servants. They were not on anyone's like want list uh, on an invitation. It wasn't like, oh, we really need to get the servants at this party. It's going to be popping if they're here. No, no, no. They weren't on anybody's wish list. But Jesus kind of flips that script upside down and says that if you want to be the greatest, you must be servant of all. We're going to go over to Proverbs 3, 27. And it says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. I think this is such a great verse because so oftentimes we think of serving as having to be this extravagant thing or this really difficult thing. But right here it's saying something that we can serve in very simple ways. If it's within our power to do good, why not do it? With my friends, one of the things I love to do is I love to pay for food when we're out eating. And the reason why is that it just shows a simple thing of like, I appreciate your company. And oftentimes when I'm talking with friends, they might mention something, and it's not like intentional to them, like, I'm going to get him to pay for my meal. We'll mention something maybe about finances of like, oh, it's been difficult financially. And I'm like, perfect, this is a way I can serve them. It lets them know I value them. And you get to pay for their meal. And it's a way that you can extend love. Now, there is a sense of practicality. If I'm like, oh gosh, I hope I can pay for this meal, I'm not going to extend that because we have to have that practicality around us. But when it's within our power to do good, why not? I want to go to Galatians 6, 9, and 10. And it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. Now, I want to stop real quick. And it says, Let us not become weary in doing good. How many of you know you can get exhausted trying to serve people? How many of you have served people and you're like, this is miserable and they make me miserable and I don't want to do this anymore? If we don't set good boundaries, and this is not part of my sermon, but it's an important thing for you to take home. If you do not set good boundaries, you are going to be miserable. You are going to hate serving. And then you're going to be a terrible servant. You're like, Cameron, that's a little cold. No, it's the truth. And God doesn't want you giving half your heart. He doesn't want you giving away broken pieces. We need to make sure first that we are good, that we are whole, so that when we offer service, it is a beautiful offering unto God, and it is something wonderful. Because when we give everything, it's beautiful. But if you start letting different pieces infect you and invade you, and then you start getting bitter, and you're like, I don't want to do these dishes. You see me take out the trash, I take out the trash, and you get really angry and upset all of a sudden. And some of you are like, hey, he was at my house last night after dinner. Um, but the reality is we all feel these things. We start getting bitter because it's no longer something that we love because we've let in serving take over everything, and we've made an idol out of serving. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. If we do not give up, it's a wonderful thing because it requires perseverance a lot of the time. And the nice thing, it says, we will reap a harvest. Isn't that wonderful? God says a workman's worthy of his wage, and he means it. And a lot of times when we serve, we're like, well, we're not working, we're just volunteering, we're serving. But God doesn't let anything go unnoticed. When you serve him 
with a joyful heart, he's going to reward that. He's not going to be like, ah, thanks, buddy. He's going to take that. He's going to take it to heart. And if a workman's worthy of his wage, and God's not stressing about finances, if the streets of heaven are paved with gold, if he says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills, I know all the birds of the mountain. If I were hungry, I would not tell you because the world is mine in all its fullness. If he's not panicking, that's kind of an employer I'd love to work for. That's kind of someone who I want to serve. And that's not our main motive by any means, but it's definitely nice to know that God is paying attention, that he's got our back. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong in the family of believers. Now, I find this funny because a lot of times people are like, ah, they're sinners, we should love them. And then as soon as like a Christian crosses them, they're like, ah, I bet you're really saved, aren't you? I bet you if you actually went to church and loved Jesus a little more, you'd know a little bit. I bet you, and all of a sudden we get real cross with someone real quick. But the reality is, these are our family. We are a family of believers and we are called to love deeply with them. And how many of you know your family more than anyone else can get you crossed in a second? They know the buttons to push just to make you mad and all of a sudden you're uh, frustrated, but we are to do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Now, a servant's heart requires one thing essentially, and without it, you're not going to be a good servant. And it's a word that we all just absolutely love, and it's submission. How many of you know that's a painful word to hear, the idea of submission? We don't like that because the thing about submission is it's not when we're like, oh, I love what we're going to do. Yeah, let's do that. That's a great idea. Yeah, let's move forward with that. Yeah, I can totally get behind that. It's when you're all of a sudden out of job and you're like, that is a stupid decision. Are they really going to do that? Oh my goodness, that person is dumb. Bless their heart. Um, hey, buddy, are you sure you want to? And we get that out too. No, when we submit with joy in those circumstances, that's true submission. When we see it and we're like, I don't know why they're going to do that, but I'm going to get behind them and support them. That is true submission. And it requires a number of things. First off, it requires humility. I like what uh, C.S. Lewis said. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. I think that's a good principle to live by because so often in times we try to self-deprivate ourselves in a way of seeming more humble. But God hasn't called us to self-deprivation. He doesn't want us to tear ourselves down or to make ourselves feel little. God says wonderful things about us. We should believe those wonderful things. However, we shouldn't put such a huge importance on ourselves. I think Jesus, better than anyone, exemplifies humility. And you're like, obviously, Cameron, any like quality you're going to list is like Jesus is going to exemplify that best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Granted, granted. I mean, he is going to win out. But I think humility is just the more you study the life of Jesus and the pure humility that he lived in, it's breathtaking and beautiful. So let's think about it. Jesus, he is God. Now let's unpack that a little more. Jesus is God. He created the heavens and the earth. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That means that when he was in heaven and is in heaven now, he is king over everything. Everyone in heaven is bowing down, worshiping, adoring, serving him. Sounds like a pretty great place to be. Last thing, if I were God, that I'd want to do is leave that. He came to a world he created. And then we brought sin in and messed up that world. So he comes to a fallen world, to a people he made who reject him, who despise him who push him away. And he comes to a people who call him cursed. His own people, his, the Jewish members that he is called for his own, call him cursed. They put him on a cross, which is by far the most painful way of execution they had at the time. So painful, in fact, that the Romans were like, wow, we need to create a new word for this. And if you're curious, it's excruciating. It's from the cross because it was so painful. They eventually decided to outlaw it because it was too cruel, in their opinion. He died on a hill. Now think about this. You're the creator of heaven and earth, and you're making the world. And at the foundations of the earth, God knew Jesus was going to die on that cross. Like I said, it's a good thing I'm not God because if I were designing that hill, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Golgotha. It's pretty ugly. It's not incredible. 
it's not beautiful. If I had been God, I'm like, this is going to be the best looking place ever. They're going to be like, wow, such beauty. Like, man, isn't that such a... No, Golgotha was ugly. Like, if you're going to create something like that, you're going to die. God didn't care about that. It's complete humility. So he comes and he dies on a cross by people that have rejected him. And he does it simply because his comfort was not worth our eternity. He valued us far more than he did himself. If you want to take a step further, if you look at Jesus' birth, it's nothing but humble. There was no room for him in the inn. He was laid in a manger. And a lot of people are like, oh, that doesn't sound so bad because they think a manger is like an inn or like a barn. A manger is a feeding trough. Can you imagine like your baby coming out and you're like, oh, here's a dog bowl. Like, let me just set him in there. Like, you're not going to be, you're not going to be okay with that. None of you would be like, okay, if the doctor was like, hey, we ran out of beds. Um, but like my horse has this, uh, this like trough that I can just like put, and you're going to be like, excuse me? You're not going to be okay with this. He's wrapped in swaddling cloth. Now, I don't know if you guys know what that means, but Jewish people had to carry swaddling cloth with them because if they were to touch someone on the road that was like bleeding, they'd become unclean. And so they'd carry these cloth in case someone was injured or some type of incident happened. They could use those cloths and touch them with that so they would not themselves be unclean. And isn't it beautiful that Jesus was wrapped in something that meant unclean and he came and cleansed us? His birth was nothing but humble. In Philippians 2, 3 through 8, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even on a cross. Now, there's this great story, and I'm pretty sure it's Rick Renner. If not, someone can correct me. But I believe it was Rick Renner that God came to him in a vision and told him, like, I'm going to use you to reach the nations. I'm going to do an incredible work in you, and many people are going to come to faith because of your ministry. And he's telling them all these things, things, and Rick Renner's getting excited. He's like, oh, cool. I'm going to go to the nations. I'm going to start preaching. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to do this cool work. I'll be like all the other guys I know that are doing big things. He goes to his pastor. Pastor, guess what just happened? God gave me a vision. I'm going to go to the nations. The pastor's like, great. Here's a plunger. Toilets need a uh, plunging. Can you go fix that? And he's like, I don't think you understood what I just said. Like, I'm about, <clears throat> I'm about to go to the nations. And he's like, how are you going to go to the nations if you're not able to plunge a toilet? If you can't serve in a very clean setting like a church, how are you going to go to a third world country where it's a mess? If you're not willing to serve in the house of God, surrounded by other believers where it's nice and polite and clean, comparably to the rest of the world, how are you going to serve? And don't get me wrong. I know I'm speaking on humility, and all of you guys are like, oh, man, he must be really good at this. No, I'm not. I'm terrible at it. Like, this is a constant battle for me. I'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm doing great. Like, oh, no, we're not going to do it this way. I know so much better. And then God's like, really, do you? And you're like, ha, ah, I'm just kidding, Lord. So I may be speaking on these things, but trust me, I am far from perfecting any of these. So, next, I want to talk about diligence. I like the word diligence because it means careful and persistent work and effort. It's not just persistent work, because that would just be endurance, but it's careful and persistent work. You know, a servant's heart doesn't just serve once. It doesn't just say, one and done, I'm good, like, I did that task, I'm finished for the rest of my life. A servant's heart continues. We're going to go to Proverbs 14.4. It says, Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You guys are like, cool. 
Uh, that, that's great. Um, but if you look at it, and it's one of those, like, I don't know about you guys, when I read Proverbs, like, I do a terrible job at reading Proverbs because you're supposed to, like, read it slowly and appreciate each And I'm like, hey, a minute, a minute, no, a minute. And when you stop and look at this, though, there's so much richness in this. You look at it and it says, where no oxen are, the trough is clean. And you're like, yeah, obviously, like, you can't have a... But if you think about that, this is saying that if you want work, there's going to be a mess. But in that mess, there is a blessing because you can't have your harvest. You can't have your blessing without that ox. I'd love to see any of you strap a plowshare to your back and try and drag it through the dirt. It ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. I'm sure some of you are really strong, but it doesn't matter. That ox is far stronger. And so there's a lot of mess with an ox. And it's not just cleaning out, like getting new food, getting new water. No, you're going to have to deal with a lot of poop. And in life, you're going to have to deal with a lot of poop. And you're going to have to clean it out. And it's frustrating. And you're like, this isn't very glamorous. And a lot of times, serving isn't glamorous. But it's so important. I love the story of Joseph because one of the things I love to do when I read the Bible is insert yourself into the narrative. Imagine if you were that person. Imagine if you had to stand in their place and do what they did. I can tell you I would not react as well as Joseph did. Can you imagine... I don't know how many of you have siblings, but imagine your siblings decide to sell you. That would suck. I mean, the people that you're growing up with that are supposed to love you, we always talk about family having your back, and some of you grew up in great families, some didn't, but how many of you had your siblings sell you? I don't know about you, but I'd be incredibly discouraged after that. The last thing I think I'd be thinking as a servant is like, I'm going to do my best work. I'm going to make the best out of this. It's going to be grand time. But that's what Joseph did. He got sold into Potiphar's house, and instead of being in a pity party, he decided he'd start working. And he started doing a really good job. And it wasn't just persistent work. How many of you know you can go to work every day, keep doing the same thing over and over, and not be doing a good job? But diligence is careful and persistent. Joseph was diligent. He was careful and persistent. Soon enough, he rose to being second in Potiphar's house, only below Potiphar. And that's why when Potiphar's wife came and wanted Joseph, Joseph makes the statement of, everything in my master's household is under my command, and I'm second only to him. How then can I do this great sin against God? And I love that perspective, because he's saying, I am second in command, so how can I sin against God? God has blessed me with where I am currently So how could I sin against him? And of course, we know the story. She doesn't get him. She gets upset. She cries rape, and he gets thrown in prison. And it's interesting to note that realistically at that time, if he had actually done the acts he was being accused of, Potiphar would have put him to death immediately. He wouldn't have put him in prison. So there's a bit of a blessing in that. Potiphar probably knew, like, oh, my wife's lying. But at his position and stature, you can't ignore a claim like that. You have to act. So Joseph gets thrown in prison. Second time, insert myself into the narrative. I would definitely be having a pity party. I'd be like, Lord, I thought you were blessing me. I've been working really hard. You've seen me doing all of this stuff. I've been trying to make sure that it was the best and the best. And now I'm in prison. Like, thanks. And I'd be having myself a pity party. But not Joseph. He decides he's still going to be diligent. And he ends up rising in the prison. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when's the last time you heard about someone in prison all of a sudden being like buddy-buddy with the guards. When's the last time you were like, oh yeah, he came in and he's been great. We love putting like everything that we have, we give it to him. He makes it so much better. We trust him with everything. Normally that is not the narrative in a prison. It is like, oh, that person's in prison. Uh, Let's not trust them. Let's not treat them well. But Joseph is trusted in the prison. He rises in stature. And eventually, he makes his way to the palace where he becomes second only to Pharaoh in the land. Diligence isn't always fun. Sometimes there's a pit. Sometimes there's a prison. Sometimes it's Potiphar, and Potiphar still wasn't the best. But eventually, you make it to the palace, and it's worthwhile. We're going to move on to obedience. Isn't this one a fun one? Don't you guys just love obedience? I mean, it's just so much fun. Um, but I think someone that exemplifies this well is Gideon. Um, We see in Judges that God comes to Gideon, and he tells him he has an assignment. 
And Gideon's very reluctant at the beginning, eventually agrees. And he's like, okay, what are we going to do? He's like, you're a mighty warrior. We're going to go to war. Uh, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's go to war. Okay, um, we don't really have many men. Okay, don't worry about it. 32,000 men arrive. He's stoked. He's like, wow, this is more than I expected. And God's like, great, we're going to get rid of them. And he's like, what? And I don't know about you, but there have been times where I was like, especially in my RA job in college, I was a resident assistant. And so there's a number of processes and different things you have to do that sometimes you just think are stupid and they don't make sense. And I'm sure all of you have been in that position with your employer where you're like, oh, this is stupid. It's not going to work. Um, we should revise it. And you're just like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you're like, this is going to end miserably. This is going to be a train wreck. But one of the things I love about Gideon is he trusts God and he's obedient because it's not enough just to be humble and diligent because if you're not obedient, you're acting with a rebellious heart. So Gideon has 32,000 men. God tells him, he's like, go and tell all the people that are scared to go home. Gideon's probably thinking like, does that mean me? Like, I'm like a little scared. This isn't my position. Can I go? And so 22,000 men go home. Now, if you're doing the math, 32,000 minus 22,000, you're left with 10,000 men against an enormous army. Those are not the odds that you want. So Gideon's like, okay, we have 10,000. We good? And God's like, no, no, no. It's still too much. And he's like, Lord, you don't understand. We're going to battle. We need men. More men equals a, a better army. And God's like, nah, nah, nah. I got this. And Gideon's like, I don't think you do. I don't think you understand. Like, the, um, I know you're not down here, but wars work a little bit differently down here. And so God's like, I have another test. He's like, uh, another? Okay. He's like, we're going to send them down to drink water. Drink water? Yeah, I'm going to get rid of some people based on how they drink water. Oh, uh, Lord, I don't, I don't, okay. We're going to, so he sends all the men down there. And the men that pick it up and scoop it in their hands and start lapping it are the ones that he decides to keep. And I don't know about you, and uh, I ended up talking to Michael Beeman after the first service, and he actually brought up a good point of why this would be the people you'd keep. But before that, I would have been like, I literally have no idea why you'd pick the people that are like lapping it like a dog. Like, those would be the people I'm like, these are weirdos. We're sending them home. Um, I don't, I don't want to be in the middle of battle. And they're just like, hold on. <laughs> Michael actually made a good point of when your head's up, you can actually look for what's coming. So, like I said, good thing I'm not in charge of a lot of things because battles would go terribly. I'd be like, that, that person's not drinking like a weirdo. We're going with them. Um, so out of the 10,000 people, 300 weirdos decide to lap it like a dog. And God's like, we're keeping them. And Gideon's like, 300 people? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Anyone else we're going to cut? No, 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 no. Okay, good. So we're good to go to battle. Not, not quite yet. What, what do you mean, Lord? So I was thinking, instead of sending you in with swords and shields, let's get rid of those. Excuse me, Lord? You're going to give us like bows and we're going to shoot from it. No, 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 no. Okay, what are we getting? What are we getting? Clay pots. Stay with me. And torches. Excuse me, Lord? Clay, clay pots and torches? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 I forgot something. Okay, it's, it's like a sword or an axe or a, a trumpet. Now, I tell you guys, like, understand this narrative. If you were Gideon, would you be excited about this? Would you be like, I'm going in with 300 men and clay pots and torches and trumpets? No, I promise you, your first thought would not be like, yeah, victory is ours, praise the Lord. You'd be like, Lord, I'm really extremely questioning your decisions, and I know you're omniscient and omnipotent and uh, all those other things, but um, um, I don't think you understand the dynamics of war. And thankfully, God knows. Thankfully, God is in control. And thankfully, we can trust him. And when it comes to being a servant, having a servant's heart, sometimes you just have to be obedient and trust. Like I mentioned, a lot of times in the RA job, I thought the things I had to do were stupid. One day, there was this incident that happened, and this person was like trying to claim something really bad about me. And they were like, he was incompetent, he's lying about all of this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And because of the a million processes that I absolutely despised and loathed because they were tedious, they were like, 
don't worry, we have complete evidence and proof that you did none of this. You are fully legally protected by the university and we defend you 100%. And because of so many other things stacked up against him, because of this long, ridiculous process, I ended up being perfectly fine. You see, oftentimes our leaders and the people that we are under know because they've been there. So obedience is required for those who are in submission. Let's move on to sacrifice. Now, oftentimes sacrifice, we want to think of these big, grandiose stories, but sometimes sacrifice is a bit smaller than that. Sometimes it's just sacrificing our time, our money, comfort, energy. And I love this story of Arona in... Let me find, where is that? In 2 Samuel 24. Um, I'm going to read it for you guys, but before I do, I should give you uh, a little bit of history on what's happening right now. I, uh, I forgot in the first service, and I just started reading, and it made no sense what was happening. It's kind of funny for me. Um, so right now, there is a plague over Israel. It happened because David decided to count the men. And when he did that, he was putting his faith in the amount of men that they had rather than in the Lord. And so the Lord gave David three options of what could happen. And David responded, whatever happens, do not let me fall into the hands of my enemy. Let me fall into your hands. Side note, it's a great response to have. If you mess up in life, it's always better to fall into the grace of God than anywhere else. Your enemies will chew you up and spit you out. But the grace of God is beautiful. So there's a plague over Israel. And after a while, David's praying how to get rid of it. And finally, this is where we pick up in 2 Samuel 24, 18. On that day, Gad went to David and said to him, Go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arona and the Jebusite. So David went up, and the Lord had commanded through Gad, When Arona looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Arona said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the lord so that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arona said to David, let my lord the king take whatever he wishes and offer it up. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering. Here's the threshing sledges and the ox yokes for the wood, your majesty. Arona gives all this to the king. Arona also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king replied to Arona, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Now at this point in the story, everyone's like, Wow, David's so great. He has such a great heart. I don't want to talk about David. David's great. He has a lot of things. But I want to talk about Arona. The reason why is there's so many stories in the Bible where people get mentioned briefly. And we glance over their names. But if the Bible mentions someone by name, it's probably important. There's a lot of people that are mentioned real briefly that did incredible things. And the reason why is as we continue, it says, So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer in behalf of the land, and the plague on Israel was stopped. Yay! So if we look at this in 1 Chronicles 21, verses 23 uh, through 25, it says, Arona said to David, take it. Let my lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. But the king, David, replied to Arona, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the lord what is yours, or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. And this next verse, it says, So David paid Arona 600 shekels of gold for the site. Now you're like, wait, it just said 50 shekels of silver. Thankfully, there are a lot of people that uh, understand Hebrew and are scholars in this. Because that, when I was reading this, I was like, that's kind of a huge disparage. Like 50 silver shekels versus 600 gold shekels. So I was like, what's happening? And thankfully, there are a lot of other people that understand these. And so when it talks about the 50 shekels of silver, Greek language is very specific. 
And so any, the words conjugated batch, then it's talking about the offering pieces. So the sledges, the wood, and all of those things, the grain offering, was about 50 shekels of silver. Now the site itself, as it shows here, says that David paid him 600 shekels of gold for the site. Now one of the things about the Bible is that it was written a long time ago. And most of us don't know actually how much 600 shekels of gold and 50 shekels of silver equals. Thankfully, I love math and I'm a nerd. So one of the fun things I get to do was I was studying like, oh, what was the trade of silver versus then versus now? 51 years salary is what Arona said that he would offer for free. 51 years salary. Equivalent today, that'd be over $2,500,000 for the average American. The heart that he had, talk about sacrifice. This piece of land might have been everything he had to survive off of, selling this land in pieces and giving it to other people. And he said that he would give it all. And if you go back, and I love what he says, and it's in the Second Samuel 1, he says, why has my Lord the King come to his servant? Such a beautiful thing. The incredible sacrifice he was willing to make. And sometimes our sacrifice is much smaller. Sometimes it's the day out of our time. Sometimes it's a couple hundred dollars. And I hope that someday I can say that I have that kind of servant's heart where I'm willing to sacrifice something like that. But it's such beauty. Can you imagine, like, he told them, like, no, thank you. But David, being a man after God's own heart, decided to honor that and give him that anyways. And in one day, Rona went from having however much money to having 51 years worth of salary in one moment. God's a great God. We're going to move on to love. Because up until this point, we've talked about humility diligence, sacrifice, um, and obedience, but all of that doesn't matter if you don't have love. Some of us know people that just don't serve with a joyful heart, with a loving heart. And it's kind of discouraging to see, and we often don't want to be around those people. And one of the things that we do love hearing about, though, is we love hearing about love. We love hearing about when people have such extraordinary love that they do the most ridiculous things in serving someone else. We hear these stories about a man decides to get one million roses and like covers like a field with them and like proposes. Or we hear about like someone having 70 years of marriage and they're still going above and beyond because love calls us to serve. Love keeps us moving. We can't stop when we love someone. We keep going and keep going. And the marriages that we aspire to are the ones that have love, not the ones like, well, we've been married, so we're just going to keep going until death do us part, because that's what we're supposed to do. And we're going to keep going. It's the ones that you see them, and they're sitting next to their sweetheart at 70 years old, and they're like, hey, sweetie, what do you want to do? And then you like hear them talking, and they're like, oh, she's my sweetheart. I've loved her since day one. And your heart just like is melting. You're like, tell me more. You're just like, okay, I, I'm here for this. And we love those stories. We want that. And I think a great story is in 2 Samuel 9. We're not going to turn to it for time's sake, but I'll explain it. This is the story of Mephibosheth. So it's a fun name. Get to pronounce it. Um, how many of you know who Mephibosheth is? Awesome. So you're going to love the story hearing it again. So, David and Jonathan were close. David said that Jonathan was closer to him than any woman, closer than his wives, because they had such an amazing relationship. He loved him. Jonathan died in battle with Saul, and the only one left of Jonathan's family is Mephibosheth. When Mephibosheth's nanny found out that Saul and Jonathan had died, she's freaking out. She's thinking he's going to die next because what happens when a new king comes into power? Well, you wipe out the rest of the lineage, anyone that may claim position to the throne. So she grabs him, is running out with him, drops him. He becomes paralyzed. David comes to the people at the palace and he says, is there anyone alive? 
from Jonathan's family so that I might show kindness. And then you're like, well, there's Mephibosheth. And they're like worried, like, is he going to do something bad? Is this really going to be something? He shows up to him, and Mephibosheth's like terrified because you have the king who ha- normally would be coming to kill you. And he's like, hi, how, how can I help you? And he actually ends up saying, what can a dead dog like me do for you? And David flips the script, and he says, I want you to eat at my table. I want to show you the kindness that I would show to Jonathan because I love him. You will eat at my table every single day. And not only that, but all the land that your grandfather Saul had, and that your father Jonathan had, I give to you. Now, I don't know if you guys understand, but a king's power comes from his land. The more land you have, you can invite nobles to live on it. You tax it. You charge them. It's a lot of income for the king. You don't give away land for free, especially everything that Saul, uh, that Saul would have had and Jonathan would have acquired. That would have been enormous. And he gives it all to Mephibosheth, someone who couldn't have fought back, someone who wouldn't have been able to lay claim to anything because of the love. Many of you know in your relationships, it is your love that keeps you going back to serving. It is the love that you have that causes you to do it with joy. So I think the question ends up being, how are we to serve? You know, Albert Einstein said, only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. I think that's really beautiful. I'll say it again. Only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. You know, it's a true statement. Many people say it that you can't bring anything to the grave with you. Your house is not going to fit in your coffin. Your car, nobody's going to be like at your funeral. You had a really amazing car. Like, unless they're like gunning for your car and it's like your like grandson, like, I remember so many moments with my grandfather in his car that I hope he put in his will to me. Um, Like, nobody's talking about your car. Nobody's talking about your house. And I have been and worked at many funerals. It's not what's remembered at all. The moments you spent with people, the love you shared, how they were a servant. I can't tell you how many times it's always talked stories of like, I was having a bad day one time, and he might not have remembered this, but he came in and said this thing to me, and it was them serving them. These are the things that are remembered. These are the things that matter. Things that don't stay in the day, but they live past your lifetime. In 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, it says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Christ Jesus. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Starting back at the top of that verse, it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received. God's not like, hey, you know that gift that Timmy has over there? I need you to be more like Timmy. He's not asking you to be someone else. And I think one of the greatest examples of this is in Exodus 4-2. This is when God shows up to Moses, and he's asking him to do something incredible. He's like, I want you to go back to Egypt. And Moses is like, that place where I've murdered someone and I'm a fugitive? Yes, I want you to go back to there. Okay, sure. What am I doing? I'm going to tell you to tell the Pharaoh to let my people go. Lord, I'm not really good at speaking. You see, I have the stutter, and I'm not, I'll be able to, I'll make it so that you can speak. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can do that. Fine, fine. Your brother will go and speak on your behalf. But Lord, how am I, how am I going to convince them? And it comes in with this statement. The Lord says to him, what is that in your hand? Moses, the staff, Lord. It's like the 2020 version. It's a, no, um, he tells him it's just a staff. And God tells him he's going to use that staff to work wonders. How many of you realize that Moses' staff didn't just stop being the thing that he used when he was talking to the Pharaoh? Yes, he threw his staff down and it turned into a snake. But going on beyond that, when they were leaving, 
is uh, leaving Egypt and going towards the wilderness. He used that staff to raise it up, and the Red Sea split. How many of you know after that, that when they needed water, he used his staff to strike the rock? That staff ended up being something that God continued to use. God doesn't ask you to use something you don't have. He's not going to ask you to do something that you physically can't unless he's going to do a supernatural, supernatural miracle through you. When we see the widow's oil and you see Elisha talking to her and she's like, I'm about to have debt collectors, debt collectors come and take everything. I have nothing except some oil. Elisha's like, great, you have oil. We got this. And so he tells her, go into your house and pour out the oil into every vessel. Go to your neighbors and grab all the vessels you can. He used what she had, not what she didn't have. We go to the story of the feeding of the 5,000. What was there? Some fish and bread. God will use what you have. God created you on purpose for purpose. We hear this all the time. But God didn't make any mistake when he made you. Your personality is specifically engineered for what God has called you to do. So many times people question what their calling is in life. But God made you the way you are for a reason. He didn't make someone super artistic and wonderful at drawing and sculptures. And then I was like, hey, I know exactly where to put you. So you're going to be in mathematics. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the ones and zeros are going to just fascinate you. I know you love being creative, but I'd rather put you behind a desk in a cubicle and just have you do math equations all day, okay? God hasn't made a mistake on anyone. I think oftentimes we worry like, I'm waiting for the voice of God to call out from heaven and tell me what to do. What does God put in you? God already created you and did a wonderful work. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So what does God put in you? I like what, uh, I told you guys the story of Gideon earlier, and I like Gideon's objection because I think it's an objection we all have occasionally. And many people throughout scriptures have the same objection, and it's, I'm not enough. So let's go to Judges 6.15. It says, <clears throat> and I like how polite it is, pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. So what he is saying is, okay, there's like 12 tribes. I'm like from the weakest tribe. In my tribe, I am like, we have the weakest family. And of my family, I am the weakest person. You have millions of people to choose from. It obviously isn't me. And God's like, no, I, I didn't make a mistake. I, I've called you. You see, when we have this humility, when we have a heart that's willing to be obedient, that's who God calls. He doesn't call the people that are at the top because they have something that God needs. God can equip you with everything you need. He's already equipped you with everything inside, and God just needs you to be willing. And there's so many different places that we can serve. I know oftentimes we worry about where am I going to serve or how am I going to do this, but God has created us for service. We are to serve God. Going back to some of the verses I mentioned at the beginning, we see that God is a rewarder of those who keep serving. We saw that in Galatians 6, 9, and 10. We know that we are to serve our friends and family. And oftentimes, those are the people that we are most irritated by. We are to serve others also. We have an amazing call in our lives to serve. And it makes such a deep impact. At the end of the day, a life without service is not a life really worth much. When we serve others, when we love others, there's a difference made. I know in my life there have been a number of times where I've just been down. I've just been depressed. Now I was out of energy. But God put amazing people in my life. And they have served me. And they have loved me. God has the same thing for you. And some of you, whether you know it or not, have been those people that have spoken life and encouragement to me in moments where I was down. And the funny thing is we'll never know everything that we've done. We'll get to the end of our life and never hear a fraction of what we've done. The uh, RMAI retreat was this week, and so there were a bunch of Rhema pastors in house. And I loved what one of the guys mentioned. Uh, his name was Tony Cook. 
he made the statement, and it was like the last day he was just kind of making like a, a mention about this, and he was referencing it for something else. And so he probably was like, ah, it's not going to really make a difference like as I'm saying this. And it's funny because he was talking about the parable of the sower uh, sowing the seed, and he talks about how some falls on the wayside, some on the rocky soil, uh, some into the thorns, and finally some on good soil. He's like, so you got a 25% chance there of getting something good. And everyone was kind of chuckling. He's like, well, even then, like, you have some that was 30, some 60, and finally 100 fold. He's like, so if you break that down, you got an 8% chance of landing something good. And everyone was kind of laughing and chuckling about it. And to me, I was like, that's wonderful. If only 8% of you, like, leave here and are like, I got something out of it, that's fine by me. Like, I am okay with that, honestly. Because I can't tell you how many times I've heard a message or someone served me, and it was that 8%, and it made a difference. There's so many times you do these small acts that you don't know, and it's going to make a difference. It's going to last with someone a lifetime. Pastor Fred always uh, ends every service with an opportunity, and it's to accept Christ as Lord, and their heart is that they never want a service to go by and someone not have the opportunity to accept and call on Christ as Lord. So I want to extend that same offer to you guys today. If any of you have not accepted Jesus, it's not a scary thing. It's not something you should be worried about. A lot of times I know like this moment comes and people are like, well, I don't want to put my hand up. Like People will look at me. You are in a house full of believers that want to celebrate with you if you get saved. Or some of you might be feeling like, well, I mean, I was saved at one point. I walked away from my faith and I just, I don't know how I feel about it. There's a lot of questions I have, and this is a great place to get answers. Ask people. But we want to be with you if you want to rededicate your life today. So as we bow our heads and get ready for prayer, if there are any of you that want to accept Christ as Lord or rededicate your life, go ahead and raise your hand now. I'm not going to call you up here to the front and like point you out or make fun of you or anything like that. We want to pray with you. See that hand? See that hand? Thank you. And on Facebook, if there are any of you that want to be a part of that, you can comment in the section and let us know because we'd love to reach out. We'd love to connect with you. Now with heads bowed, I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer. And as a church body, if you'd like to say it with me so those that are saying it don't feel alone, you can repeat after me. Dear Lord, we thank you that you were such a good servant that you died on the cross for me, that you paid the penalty for my sins. And today, I make a declaration that you will be my Lord, that what you say, I will say, that what you call me to do, I will do. And I will always pursue you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Fred also ends in a blessing. And uh, I tried to ask uh, Pastor Mark or Pastor Dean if they want to do it last service, and they said no. So I'm guessing the answer is going to be the same. So um, I will uh, pray a blessing over you guys. So if you would like, you can lift your hands. If not, you can sit there. But I'm just going to pray over you. Pray that the Lord bless you and keep you that he prospers you in all your ways. Pray that no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you in judgment shall be condemned. You are made to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You are protected as you go throughout your day, that you are always increasing in the knowledge and the fullness of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your people and watching over them. Amen. Well, we thank you. You always have an option. And so thank you for flying with uh, Grace Life Air. Um, you are dismissed. Bye-bye.